Greetings and welcome to the Mount Rushmore Podcast. My name is Jeff and I'm joined as always by my good friends Richard. Hello. And Michael. Howdy. <laughs> Richard and Michael like to debate and deliberate many different aspects of many different topics. And this episode's topic is the Mount Rushmore of mood. The Mount Rushmore of movie adaptations of children's books. Michael chose it. Why? Well, I, I do like moody adaptations moody. of children's books, and we're just going to spend uh, 40 minutes talking about where the wild things are. Yeah. Boy, that is a fucking oh. moody adaptation like of a children's Xanax. book. Xanax. Oh, my uh, God. Yeah. I don't know if it's on your list, Richard, but... Um, um, uh, um, uh, um, uh, oh, boy. Okay. Okay. Um, so I, this is my choice, and... <laughs> It was my choice because, you know, I have a five-year-old who, and now we're just, we're just plowing through movies on like Amazon and like uh, stars and HBO and whatever, just anything that, you know, I can get them to watch like a new kid's movie. So we don't watch something that we had watched 400 times, you know, we're, we're, I think we're over though, having watched Frozen a 32nd time, you know, and it's been a couple years in that since Mm -hmm. that's happened. But um, so we're watching like, you know, some preview for, I don't know, whatever, uh, or some, some movie or we're watching some garbage TV series. And then a commercial for Lyle Lyle Crocodile came on. Oh, wow. And I guess it's some children's book, some picture book. From the... my, one of my favorite when I was a little kid. Yeah. You liked it. Okay. So I, oh, yeah, I, yeah. it never quite never heard for of me. it. Yeah. I'm a I generation I... before you guys. I think. So it's about like a crocodile that like lives with a family and. You know, oh, okay. in like an apartment yeah. in New York or whatever. And then it got me thinking, oh, you know, well, at least this looks like well animated. I'm sure it looks fun. He like sings and does whatever. And it's silly. I was like, well, I'll probably see this at some point. And then I started thinking of other, you know, adaptations and how sometimes they are um, like note for note. Sometimes they are, they take like the a small element of it and turn it into a much bigger thing. Um, sometimes, um, they're a Harry Potter movie <laughs> mm-hmm. and, uh, or like, uh, it's a movie, uh, you know, built around bears. Like, you know, there's a lot of things that go into it, like a children's, um, book and, you know, they come from such a variety of sources, you know, it could be a picture book like Lyle Lyle Crocodile. It could be, um, you know, old fantasy Lewis Carroll stuff. It could be, uh, you know, new, new sort of things where they're drawing from the types of books they're drawing from are so vast and so varied. Um, and the movies that come out of them are vast and varied too. So I thought it would be, um, pretty fun. You know, Richard's got two kids. Richard's been around the blocks and seen a ton of movies. Yeah. Yeah. He's avoided. Jeff, you did. was around the block too. Yeah. uh... (laughs) Jeff, you did the mocap for, um, (laughs) I don't know, Clifford the Big Red Dog, I believe, yeah. right? You I am, on all fours. Hey, do you know who I am? I say as a rest, uh, when I try to get a good seat at a restaurant, I'm Paddington. Yeah. I am Paddington. <laughs> they needed somebody to, to, who could consume a lot of honey. You know, I think one thing that's compelling about this is, is in terms of adaptation or even just like uh, inspiration for early, the earliest film, uh, children's books have always been there. Like some of like the first, I think, at all, you know, Alice in Wonderland, um, 1902, you know, <laughs> 1903. Yeah. So, yeah, I think that the format of film being something that once people kind of got their brain wrapped around how to do kind of basic visual effects, I think f- filmmakers found so much inspiration from the fantasy that can exist in, in, in children's books. So it almost seems like it's, it's kind of the earliest, like you had the sneeze and galloping horse <laughs> and, and then... Alice in Wonderland. So, yeah, cool. So Michael chose it. So uh, Richard, uh, you start. All right. So we mentioned it, so we might as well talk about it. All right. Uh, one of my choices is where the wild things are. Wow. The okay. Spike Jones. Yeah. Adaptation of the beloved Murray Sendak uh, mm-hmm. picture book. Mm-hmm. And I was, I, I'm fascinated by this movie because a it's the type of thing where it just felt like it never, how could you make this into a movie? Mm-hmm. Cause everything just be between the fact that it really doesn't have that much of a plot. Yeah. It's, it's not much it's, there, there. There's no there, there. Um, it's brief. It's probably what a 30 page picture book. Yeah. And then the, the visual styling of it is so unique 
that how do you take that and you turn that into mm-hmm. certainly a live action film mm-hmm. or a live action with CGI animation included and crazy son of a bitch did it, you know, um, I, I love the fact that this was marketed towards an adult audience rather than a kid's audience. Like when this came out, it was, you know, it was more playing on the idea of we're marking this to the, at the time, 30 something year olds, 40 year olds who grew up with this book as kind of an essential part of their reading library from when they were kids. It wasn't necessarily marketed to their kids. There was more the idea that they're going to have kids and they're going to take it, take them to see this movie. But really it's a movie that's more targeted towards the adult audience and everything about, I mean, just, you know, Karen O doing the soundtrack. Yeah. I mean, what a, what a fantastic and weird choice that is. And James Gandolfini as was doing, you know, ostensibly a kid's movie doing one of the voices. Yeah. That's wild. I mean, there's so many ways where it shouldn't have worked out and where it should have been a complete train wreck. And somehow the whole thing kind of comes together and it just works. I remember being really bored by it. I hated this movie. Oh, okay. wow. <laughs> okay. Okay. So- well, let's get into it. Polarizing. I, did you? Yeah, I definitely was polarizing. I, I, I would absolutely 100% agree with that. Sorry, Jeff. I didn't mean to go over the top with, you know, go from bored to just like, God, this yeah, is I shitting think, on it. I mm-hmm. think what, what I felt emotionally when I was watching this movie is I remember thinking that it was it seemed to be targeting an adult and tween market because some of the topics, if you remember Charlie Brown Christmas special. That was about the uh, ennui <laughs> that one right. feels during Christmas. It wasn't always about the happiness and excitement and all that kind of stuff. It was in a minor key, uh, some of the emotional jazz that was being played in that b- film. So I felt like where the wild things are was kind of like Spike Jones saying, you know, if you're going to give me the keys to this car, I'm going to drive it the way I do. And that is to subvert it somewhat um for sure Uh, like i think that's the thing is um he got out a lot of like he seemed to exercise feel like he exercised a lot of his own personal feelings of isolation and uh detachment and frustration and anger and you know wanting to escape obviously that's what max does in the book too he gets in trouble and goes off to his you Uh know imaginary world um I just, I just didn't, I don't know. I was kind of creeped out by it. I thought it was, was, you know, I'm fine with things being strange, but I just was like, wow, I, I've never had, maybe I I just didn't relate in that same way. Like I've never had that sort of feeling as a child of like, I need to escape from my family to this place (laughs) because of this. And, um, it was, uh, I don't know. I just, it's not that I didn't get it. I just didn't. I just didn't like it, but it goes to show, it just goes to show what an adaptation can be. It's, it's took, you know, like you said, like 32 pages or whatever it was of pretty simple story and turns into this like big tome on isolation and uh, uh, feelings of abandonment and, uh, you know, looking for a family that's not your family, all this stuff. that's just like made it so much bigger than what it, what it was initially. Yeah. yeah no, I mean, I, I guess for me, I can t- to do a little bit of what Jeff usually does and try to turn this into a psychological discussion, breaking us <laughs> both down until we start weeping. Um, you know, the whole idea of kind of not, like not feeling like you're searching for something else because you don't feel like that you're, you fit in with your family or you feel like that you're other from your family. And I know for me, you know, I grew up in a very working class background and I knew I didn't want that for myself. And so, and I knew that I wasn't destined for that. Hmm. So I always kind of felt like a little bit of a misfit toy, a little bit within my own family. Now, not to the point where I needed to make a two hour children's movie about it necessarily, but there was definitely the feeling there. Hmm. And so I think that sort of related to me. I think the fact that 
you know, I, I want to say what year, what year did the movie come out? I should know this. I think 2010. Something While you're like searching, it, there was something, sometimes I watch a movie and it, like if it was in French with um, English subtitles, I would have thought this is the most brilliant fucking thing I've ever seen in my life because True. it had a European kind of emotion to it. It, it did. So it's 2009. Okay. And, um, you know, I think for me, my oldest kid was two at the time. My only kid at the time was two and was, and, and, sh- and they were a really great kid. Um, and overall, you know, probably had a lot less outbursts and wild child moments than certainly my other kid has, or a lot of other kids in general. But even so, it's a two-year-old. Two-year-olds are moody. Two-year-olds get upset for no reason. Two-year-olds sometimes make make you feel like they don't want you to be anywhere around you ever again. So I think the fact that I, I think the fact that it hit at that exact right age for me being a parent, mm-hmm. having a kid like at the right age, at, at this kind of like wild child kind of age, yeah, sort of probably made it resonate more than if I had just seen it without having kids or even if I had seen it later on with older kids. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Just for uh, that me. makes sense. That makes Just sense. for me. Uh, you know, it's, I think something about even the cult, like you, I, I, we were talking about the child and his point of view. And for me, it was even having like James G- Gandolfini, like talk, kind of leaning down, talking to you know, Max, you know, kind of, you know, you sometimes you just got to take it easy. <laughs> you know, it was like seeing those characters seem kind of depressed. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Funny. Yeah. I, by the way, it's a quick note on this. The budget was $100 million. Box office was $100.1 million. No, they did it. Profit. Yeah. Do you think they, they sent Spike Jones a check for $100,000? <laughs> there you go. You earned it, bud. <laughs> okay. So, uh, Michael, what's your first? Uh, my first choice is, um, I if I could have, I probably would have chosen all uh, Raul Dahl. Uh, oh, <laughs> of course you would have. But I, I pared it down to one and uh, I didn't do my favorite, but I chose um, one that I thought was really just uh, well executed, which was um, uh, Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. No, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Awesome. Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, I believe, is the oh, wow. first one. No, Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. Willy Wonka is the first one. Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. Um, the 1971 um, very fun and strange and silly adaptation of um, his book, which was actually called uh, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Mm-hmm. And what I thought was so successful is that they had, you know, the the, the titular character, the star of the movie, you know, Gene, um, I almost said Gene Hackman. Gene Wilder. Gene Wilder, thank you. Gene Hackman <laughs> as Willy Wonka. Maybe, maybe a Slugworth. <laughs> Um, Gene Gene, the dancing machine. As. Uh, <laughs> Do you know that he, before he died, he had had both his legs decapitated? Oh, no. <laughs> Due to like gangrene or something. Gene like Gene, the wobbling <laughs> machine. Yeah. Sorry, uh, Gene Wilder is the lead. Uh, and he's just so great. And he like draws your attention and like pulls you through this mm-hmm. entire story. Um, but what I think it really captures well uh, uh, is that the children end up being the heroes and ultimately the villains. Like he is this kind of, you know, circus carnival Barker sort of crazy guy around, but it's the children that make the, either the good choices, the bad choices. He just kind of gives them the opportunity to. And I think that's one of the great things in most of um, Roald Dahl's children's books is the focus really is on like the children of it. Like sure. uh, You know, Willy Wonka is this, you know, uh, candy colored crazy guy but charlie is the one that is the hero at the end he makes the great choices he's and for kids books seeing yourselves in the kids is so important you know you um and i think that i think the movie just did everything right with that you know it had singing and musical numbers that were totally unnecessary for their adaption but it works somehow within the frame of the the movie it's just like oh it's just it's a musical so things just start happening you know musical mm-hmm. things just start happening and um i don't know i just just great 
Cool. Uh, my, yeah, my, I agree. Yeah, my second choice is Matilda, by the way. Oh, great. So, so we can double doll. Double doll. Okay. DD, double doll. Um, yeah, I, I think I, I chose Matilda for many of the same reasons that Michael probably chose Willy Wonka in the Chocolate Factory. You know, I think Roald Dahl has a, had a unique way to sort of be able to speak directly to kids that, you know, it did, never came off as force, never came off as condescending. It's really easy to make, I think, a kid's piece of literature or or film or whatever it happens to be. And then make it seem like that you're talking down to kids. He's so something... good. At, he's so good at making adults villainous and horrible. <laughs> yes. There's also that. I was just going to say, he also has a stripe of a misanthrope in him. Yeah. Uh, not enough that it, that it's filters down to like the kids, but certainly with the adults and certainly with Matilda, with the, with the exception of Miss Honey. Every every adult in that movie is horrible, <laughs> and of course, and the casting of Danny DeVito and Real per- Rhea Perlman as the parents is perfect. <laughs> if you if you need spiteful kind of mean little shrewish people, you, you've kind of hit you've kind of hit the nail on the head with those two. No offense, I'm sure they're lovely, wonderful people in real life. Don't want to don't want to risk them not coming on the show at some point. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I, you know, I didn't grow up with Roald Dahl books. It just wasn't something that came into my, my worldview. So I wound up watching the movies later on as, as adults, as an adult, really. And it was just, you know, a fascinating world that he had created. And I think that that's, like I said, with, and as Michael said, you know, really kind of focusing on the kid being the hero of the story and being as a kid, I can see where you would absolutely project yourself onto Matilda or project yourself onto, you know, Charlie or any, any one of the other rolled doll heroes, James from James and the giant peach or something like that. Mm -hmm. And be able to, to sort of think of yourself as sort of being someone who could, live that life and do those things that these characters are doing, even if they're fantastical things. I, yeah, I think the, the amazing thing that authors who create uh, characters who are not their gender or not their nationality or not their precise circumstance, the amazing thing they do sometimes is just write them as people, fully dimensional people, um, screenwriters who want to write female dialogue, just write, dialogue that makes sense to them that's motivated by human behavior and i think doll using you know essentially treating kids as adults who just have different priorities and a different different um expectations of the world around them it was exhilarating to read as a kid (laughs) and the emotional um spectrum that he allowed kids to have that maybe Michael and I might have commented that went too far for us in um, in where the wild things are was just so appealing as as a as a child reading doll books one one also because the the children were usually outsmarting the uh, uh, mean adults yeah mm-hmm. but but it was so exhilarating to see dimensionalized <laughs> kids uh, uh, in those things I mean, what's funny is like knowing doll or reading. Reading doll the biographies of doll, you know, here's a guy who I think he was flying RAF planes when he was 18 or something like that. So, you know, he was essentially still a child when he was, like many, forced to go into war and do all these adult things. So, I, you know, I can see why he, he might uh, he might not have considered himself to be a child, but I uh, can see why he could imagine that kids can do interesting things. But yeah, that's uh, it's so intoxicating, um, kids who are taking on. Uh, tricking adults and <laughs> yeah. having having power it's almost like trick or treat every day uh for those <laughs> those books so um you know what i thought when it, we're talking about the i said the books but we mean the movie adaptation but the, definitely the uh the willy wonka seemed almost like a thing of the 70s in a way because there was so much of a anti-authoritarian um point of view to it uh these kids all of these kids come in and they question um this guy wonka they break all his rules (laughs) and then 
Wonka himself is this character who's essentially lying with this 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 commercial front that he puts on, and then uh, as an industrialist, he's really uh, very subversive and and stuff like that. And we don't know till later that he's looking to quit. He's looking to quit. <laughs> he wants to get out of that hustle of making candy. But for me, too, the doll, in as much as the kids um, are clever in Willy Wonka. They also die <laughs> nearly, um, and then there's a morality tale sung by Oompa Loompas at every you know every fifteen minutes when one of them yeah, <laughs> yeah runs afoul of their own bad intentions. <laughs> yeah, that's one thing f- is fun about Willy Wonka is the kids can be just as big assholes. <laughs> yeah, as the adults in it. Okay, uh, uh, I guess Michael, you do another Michael one second. or halftime. Yep. Yeah. Michael second. My second. Uh, my second choice is the movie Jumanji, the 1995 um, oh, wow. adaptation of the um, Carl Van Arsberg, Chris Van Allsburg, um picture book from 1981. And this is another sort of like where the wild things are uh, kind of story where like in the original story, it's some kids find this board game like at a park and they go and they play it and animals come out and chase them and all the things that happen, yada, yada. And then eh, they close it up and leave it at the park again. The adaptation of the movie adds um, like so much increased depth um, with the, uh, the, the Robin Williams character that gets sucked into the board game and is stuck there for 30 years, this generational aspect of this town that's fallen apart because of um, his parents, like, uh, struggle to find their lost son this you know uh, set of two kids that are coming into the story that also have lost their parents and feel abandoned and are bitter um, to be in this huge house in this new town with their aunt and just the you know increased zany mad cappery of um, the movie is just so fun and well done and takes the basic idea that this board game brings animals and jungle things to real life and you play it and until you win or you can't stop playing it. And then uh, just kind of amped it up to such a a incredible degree that um, it was really a tremendously just fun book. And um, we'd gone back and borrowed Jumanji from the library in the last year or so. And um, I think we borrowed Zathura as well, which is also a tremendous um, adaption. Uh, mm-hmm. by the same guy and the, like the original picture book is fine but there's like kind of nothing to it it's like it's it's a one note thing you kind of you kind of miss out on so much of the um depth that the movie adds to its uh characters does jumanji have a factory in it too the, the parents i know in the movie in the movie is there like a shoe fact or something yes the the father like owns like the local town shoe factory and um that's correct you're making you're making this easy with all these factory choices uh, <laughs> I don't oh my goodness <laughs> okay we're going to be uh uh t- continuing with our third and fourth choices after we uh, do our little halftime here and we want to invite you to go to our website uh mount rushmore podcast.com mount rushmore pod something.com and then yes, Mount Rushmore Podcast.com. Mount Rushmore Podcast.com. And then uh, just poke around and you'll see. And send me some notes on things that I've got to fix because that's a lot of stuff. And Richard uh, is telling me, and then I don't do it. So, uh, so you make sure you bug him. Great system. Oh, yeah, I, I yeah. can only do so much. Yeah. And it's the winner of the, <laughs> the <laughs> spam award. <laughs> The, the Spammies. The Spammies. <laughs> 2016 through 2022 every year. Um, yeah. I'd like to th- I'd like to thank my great aunt for forwarding on this message to me. She forward, 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 forwarded it to me, and I clicked the link, and it was, oh my goodness, it opened up all this stuff. Bill Gates will send a million dollars to everybody. <laughs> That's the reward. That's the reward. If you win a Spammy. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so um, let's jump back. Let's go to Richard's uh, third choice. Sure, my third choice is uh, Coraline. Oh, wow. The, the adaptation of the Neil Gaiman uh, novella. And that book just turned 20 years old. 
Excuse Bless me. you. You were saying, Michael? That book just turned 20 years old. I was very shocked recently to read uh, that. Really? Cool. Joyce Richard. The book wow. itself is 20 years old, yeah. That is surprising because, I mean, the movie itself is pretty – is not, like, recent or anything like that. So I guess I it was made – it's 2009. So I guess it was, wasn't was made that long after after the the book was made. Um, I, I just – I'm a huge Neil, Neil Gaiman fan. Um, it's something that our family has been listening to audiobooks of his for a long time now, the ones that are remotely family appropriate, at least. <laughs> Um, we are listening to American Gods right now with the family and doing some judicious skipping over certain parts. Hmm. <laughs> but Coraline, on the other hand, is a is a a wholly a family appropriate uh, book and film. A little bit dark, which yeah. is what I love. Which is what I love about it. Yeah. Um, it's a you know it doesn't it doesn't shy away from going to, to kind of like dark and scary places. Um, but I. I just the way that the film and the stop motion animation, I am, I'm, I'm, I'm just, I happen to be a sucker for stop motion animation anyway, for that kind of like that, that kind of uh, art craft work. And I'm fascinated by how those movies are made, how they look kind of how just the whole process behind it, just the way they did things like the other mother with the button eyes and just the way that they kind of signify the other world and and just the whole the whole look of it is as a great match it's hard it's really hard to match up what's on the page with a Neil Gaiman book there have been some great Neil Gaiman adaptations and there have been some pretty mediocre ones over the years this is one of the best for me and i just i just you know being a huge Neil Gaiman fan being a huge stop motion animation fan, a Harry Selnick fan, I just, I just adore this movie, and it's mm-hmm. something that my kids have have both gotten into, and it's a it's it's a favorite movie of everyone in our family. Well, when did they start? Was were your kids was Vivian a teen or a tween when she started? Oh, probably younger than that. Uh, probably like ten or eleven. Okay, so maybe, maybe between she- yeah early she, tween she you know i know she's or sorry you know they're very intellectual kind of uh smart kid do, do you think they had a more of a taste for the kind of the more gray area nuanced stuff than you know rugrats <laughs> or something yeah i think so i mean they're both pretty sophisticated as for being kids in terms yeah. of what they the media they consume yeah my son in particular uh, has no interest in kids films at this point Oh wow! Um, pretty much wants to watch action comedies all day. Oh okay. So anything that's got a mixture, so to get him to watch something like Coraline, which yeah. does have a lot of action sequences, and is funny, it yeah. does kind of have a lot of different things going on. Um, for him, it's a great mix. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. I- I just uh, I remember watching it, wondering who is this for? Because this seems too scary for kids and too to doesn't have enough adult themes for adults i think it has enough adult themes for adults um i think for in terms of the kids i think yes it's probably for the the older elementary school kids to middle school kids who are kind of looking for something a little bit more uh stimulating than than frozen yeah you know so yeah. I think that's 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 who it's for. It's for the weird kids. Yeah. Of which yeah. both my kids are. Okay. Yeah, th- think of how Nightmare Before Christmas was a clarion call to to the weird kids, to the ones who, you know, I, a- animation transports you to this wonderful place regular cinema can't and that and when that place is dark and weird <laughs> like the Henry Selleck usually makes it then. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Absolutely. All right, Winfield, what's your next one? Uh, my next choice is um, Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets. Oh, okay. Um, I wanted to have one of the Harry Potter films in here, and I thought that though it's not my um, favorite of them, I, I really like um, Oh Prisoner of Azkaban. I think it's just the most stylistic, and the uh, catches the kids like they're just the right kind of teenage age, and it's just a little bit darker, a little bit more sinister. I think. 
uh, the Chamber of Secrets um, adaptation was by far, I think, the most like note for note, satis- uh, very satisfying as a translation from the book. Like these books are so like dense in terms of like side plots and B plots that kind of go off in all these different areas that within the book itself ultimately resolve and ultimately are important um, to like the individual book or to the overall lore of the world. And when they like adapt one of them and remove parts of it, you're like, why didn't they have that? And it's like, oh yes, well they're, they're not going to put out a six hour movie. I, I, yeah, you, you can't yeah. do that. But with, um, Chamber of Secrets, I thought they got a lot of that really, uh, uh, really right. Like the overall look of it's a little bit more sinister than the first movie. The kids are just that much better actors than the first one. They have a little bit more, you know, experience under their belts of being these characters. And certainly by the, you know, after they've been doing them for a decade or however long it took them to complete all eight movies they're you know kind of very fully formed but i think they're really i think it gets hits all the right notes with all of their uh the acting and the choices and the visuals and it doesn't like nothing looks terrible it's all just and it's a fun <laughs> and it's a fun one before it gets kind of too dark and too grisly and the, mm-hmm. you know the real murders start happening and stuff so mm-hmm. um i don't know uh i just really like it i think they the um, the like I said, the books kind of suffer from, and the movies kind of suffer from trying, from not including what you think they should include. And I think this one is like, oh, it. I don't. I don't remember anything really being missing that we wasn't in there. So, do you feel like uh, you have a different relationship to that individual film because of it's part of a series? Uh, I know with the. I don't know if they're children's books, but com- with comics in the MCU, I feel like, mm. um, you know, just seeing Thor, Love and Thunder, no spoilers, but there's, there, each individual entry doesn't have to live or die on its own. It's part of this kind of current of content. And I wonder if a franchise with sequels um, allows you to let each thing kind of, I don't know, breathe and just be, be not the be all end all of, of the series, but to just, I don't know. Is it, do you feel, feel differently about that since it's part of a franchise? Well, I think that um, it was also very limited, you know, like Harry Potter was going to be these seven books. She, at some point, I don't know how early on in the writing of it or the decision of how long these things were going to go. There is a finite number of what this story was going to be. So yeah as long as it was like kind of all contained within that, you, I don't think you'd ever really feel like, ah, oh, they didn't get to it in this one. Maybe they'll get to it in the next one or something. Mm-hmm. But you know, with like something like Thor or whoever, these things are going to go on for years and years. There's going to yeah. be no end as long as they can make seven to $900 million every time. Yeah. However yeah, I'm yeah. excited for, I'm excited for 60 year old Chris Hemsworth starring an old <laughs> Thor. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay, uh, Thor, you're Thor. <laughs> oh my God, I'm so Thor. Uh, okay, uh, Richard, what do you got? This is your last one. Last you game. mentioned sequels, Jeff. Okay. My okay. last one is Paddington 2. Oh, you know okay. what? My my last one was Paddington, the first one. So we can... We can just roll this into one more, big how great. Okay. thing. I, I love the first Paddington movie. The second Paddington movie is perfect. It is one of those when we had that episode of Perfect a mm. few weeks ago. Yeah, I'd actually thought about Paddington too as like a perfect movie. It's just so these both of these movies are just such this delightful mixture of comedy that hits kids, that hits adults. It's got action. It's got tears. It's got everything. Sinister you, adults. Sinister adults. <laughs> it's got Hugh Grant overacting, which is mm-hmm. always a, always a delight. It's got everything you could want in a movie. And there's a reason why I think Paddington 2 was, for a long time, the most re- most reviewed movie ever to receive a 100% rating from Rotten Tomatoes. Oh, wow. Up until last year, where they found one review from 2021 where someone gave it a negative review. Oh. I want to know who this asshole was. <laughs> <laughs> 
How do you not adore Paddington too? You, you, sir, or ma'am, or whoever you are. A. 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 Milne came back from the dead. <laughs> right. <laughs> Said, "I, you're stealing my thunder." I don't know why he's southern. I don't know why he did that, but, um, you know, both the Paddington movies. Uh, I loved the Paddington books growing up. That was certainly was within my. Those were books that were within my my worldview. And they just do such a, they're charming. That's the most, yes. that's the best description I can give of the Paddington movies. They're delightful and charming. And I just, there's something that, they're, they're a world that you want to live in. They're a world that you want to go back to and revisit. There's something just very calming about this, you know, British bear from Peru who just wants to eat. It's, <laughs> it's perfect. It's just ultimately, um, you know, it's, it's, he's a very, I think what I like about the the movie is that um, it feels very British in that way. He's very polite, but he it also um, has this air of like silliness to it that I think um, a lot of English comedy has. And it, it's such a reserved society that when they are super silly, they are crazy, like a like a Monty Python or like um, yes. Uh, I can't think of anything else. Mr. Bean is just like, you know, the the ultra silly within this kind of um, kind of tight knit world. And I think Paddington and they really captured that with the movie where he's this very charming, very nice, polite bear that he's introduced into this family. And like, he's just like, oh, there's a bear there. And he talks and he's just going to come live with us and we'll, we'll be begrudging about it. And then chaos happens around him because he's kind of a klutz and kind of <laughs> strange and a goofy guy. I mean, the movie's just so delightful. I have to see them both now. Oh, you've uh, never seen them? No. Oh, you're, you're in for a treat, Jeff. I've That's all I'm going to say. Okay, okay, okay. I'm down. I am down. So this has been the Mount Rushmore of movie adaptations of children's books. Why was that so hard the first time around? I don't know. it was the first time around. I don't first know. time around, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so well, I'm going to go with Paddington's. Paddington, Paddington, uh, just because the Paddingtons and, uh, writ large. Yeah, and um, the Factory series, uh, Andy Warhol, <laughs> Willy Wonka. Uh huh. Go with the uh, Andy Warhol and the Chocolate Factory is a very <laughs> yeah. different, very different movie. Nico and Edie Sedgwick doing heroin with Lou Reed over in the corner. The the uh, so yeah, well, Andy Warhol and the Chocolate Factory. Why we do that? Uh, um, and we'll, there was so much vitriol towards where the wild things are, so let's choose that one. Uh, okay. And is that three? Why? Why? I'm like the guy who can't pick twelve donuts. Uh, Coraline. Yeah, perfect. Coraline, and That's we're cool. out. This has been the Mount Rushmore of they made it into a movie, but it was a book that was for a kid. I'm always Jeff. I'm Richard. I'm Michael. 